Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tank. My name is Alan. Today we continue on to our sixth episode of our Clone Wars history series. Now, if you guys want to check out the entire series in chronological order, please hit that playlist in the top right corner. We also have other videos that basically explain uh, how the galaxy prepared itself for the Clone Wars and all the events that led up to this conflict. In our last episode, Count Dooku and the Separatists were in the process of opening several different fronts across the Outer Rim in order to spread out the Jedi forces and Grand Army of the Republic, which already was heavily outnumbered. One of these fronts was on the strategically important planet of Christophus. Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin have successfully defeated the Separatist blockade and now have taken charge of the Republic Ground Forces in the capital of Christophus, Crystal City. Previously, the clone sergeant Slick had betrayed his fellow troopers by acting as a mole for the Separatist forces. As a parting gift, he had destroyed a large portion of the Republic's ground forces motor pool, including several LAATs and ATTE walkers. The charges had been set beforehand, so it's very likely that the traitor Slick had coordinated with Separatist leaders to do this as part of a preparation for an eventual Separatist counterattack. With limited fire support and Admiral Wolf Yorn heading back to Republic Sace for reinforcements, the Republic forces on Christophus were relatively vulnerable to a counterattack. General Horm, loathsome leader of the Separatist ground forces, took advantage of this opening and launched an assault. With only their basic small arms and a few AV-7 anti-vehicle cannons and a few small walkers left, the clones rapidly put up a makeshift defense on Crystal City's main street. Loathsome's vanguard were made up of the tougher B-2 super battle droids. These larger and more heavily armored units were much tougher than the B-1 battle droids. They were also equipped with wrist rockets and automatic laser cannons. In support, the Octoptara combat tried droids brought up the rear of the droid column. As the clones engaged the main droid force, Anakin Skywalker along with a few squads of jetpack clone troopers attacked the surface flank and managed to take out several of the Octopatara combat tri-droids. The tri-droids had a 360 degree firing arc and were quite formidable, but had a large blind spot beneath it which the clone jetpack troopers were able to exploit. Simultaneously, Obi-Wan Kenobi led a frontal charge against the Separatist droids. Which is actually quite stupid. I mean, throughout the series, we're gonna point out the many times that Jedi leaders just did terrible things with the clones. And this is one of those situations because clones are prohibitively expensive to train when compared to a battle droid. And also because they're human, they're relatively weak. Clones were expert marksmen and fought well from cover, but they lacked any super strength or speed, especially when compared to completely metal droids. So this really didn't help them in melee combat, for instance. But once the Republic's anti-vehicle cannon started firing upon the Separatist tank column, it exacted enough casualties for General Loathsome to call for a strategic retreat in order to set up deflector shields to protect their next offensive. During the reprieve, Republic reinforcements arrived, but it's not the battalion of clones that Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi had expected. Instead, it's just Wolf Yolren with one single messenger from the Jedi Council, Ahsoka Tenno. Her message is for the two Jedi to report back to Coruscant immediately for an emergency meeting. But more about that later. Because before the two Jedi can go back, they have to figure out a way to drive the Separatist threat back. To make matters worse, not only did they not get reinforced with more clone troopers, a new Separatist fleet had arrived above the surface of the planet. So for now, Anakin is accompanied by Ahsoka Tano as his Padawan learner, and they inspect the Republic lookout posts. Now, originally, Obi-Wan Kenobi was the one who put in the request for a Padawan learner, but Yoda decided that Anakin Skywalker was a better suitable candidate for this, and I think that's a good move on his part because Anakin definitely lacks the maturity, and I think giving him someone that he basically has to teach will require him to mature quickly because now he's not only responsible for his own life, but also for the life of a youngling. Anakin rightly questions Ahsoka's age, though. She's just a preteen, and it's pretty unethical for the Jedi to send children into battle. Ahsoka then goes along with Captain Rex for a while to inspect the defensive lines. This, of course, would be the beginning of a very long friendship between the two. While talking with Captain Rex, Ahsoka brings up that despite the fact that he's a captain, as a Jedi, she still technically outranks her. Captain Rex sidesteps this by saying, In my book, experience outranks everything. It's a lighthearted exchange, but it does highlight the underlying tension between the Jedi and the clones. Simply put, the clones had been trained to fight and lead soldiers into war for almost a decade. Most Jedi had almost no military training, and some, like Ahsoka, were basically children and still put in charge of entire units. This makes very little sense to me, and although most clones wouldn't complain outright, I think it doesn't make a lot of sense for them either. Yeah. 
At this point, General Losum approaches the Republic position under the cover of a giant deflector shield. This would be able to shield his forces from Republic artillery until they've basically marched right up to the Republic fortifications. While Kenobi starts fortifying their position, Anakin and his new Padawan sneak behind enemy lines in order to find and destroy the deflector shields. It's imperative that they do so because the Separatists outnumber the Republic and the only thing that's really keeping them at bay is the anti-vehicle cannons. With the shield deployed, they should be able to march right up to the cannons and destroy them, ending the conflict. Anakin and Ahsoka sneak through the Separatist front lines hidden in a cardboard box, while Kenobi and Rex spread the clones out into the various buildings along their pathway. The idea is to lure the droid army into buildings where their armor advantage is negated and where the clone troopers can leverage their terrific close quarter combat skills. Sensing his troops are about to break though, Obi-Wan Kenobi decides to call for a ceasefire and surrenders to Losum. Meanwhile, over the planet, Admiral Wolf Yolern and Yoda have arrived with the fleet of ships, including a few acclimators loaded with clone troopers. Once again, the Republic forces must break through the blockade in order to reach their ground forces. Behind enemy lines, Ahsoka and Anakin run into a few hiccups along the way, but eventually make it to the shield generator, and are able to take out the generator with just a few seconds to spare. Obi-Wan Kenobi grabs General Livesim and takes him as hostage while Republic artillery starts opening up on the Separatist's main force, while Yolaren's reinforcements arrive from orbit. The Battle of Christophus is over and the Republic has won. So using his Jedi skills and research, Obi-Wan Kenobi is able to understand just what kind of General Loathsome is. The Separatist leader was an honorable fighter and also had quite a large ego. Two traits that Obi-Wan Kenobi would use to stall Loathsome's attack long enough so that Ahsoka Tano and Anakin can destroy the deflector shield. Obi-Wan requests Loson to sit down with him and discuss the terms of surrender, while conversing the Jedi remains aloof, making sure to throw in the odd compliments every now and then, playing up Loathsome's skill as a general. It should be noted what Obi-Wan Kenobi is actually doing here is pretty sketchy and one could argue even unethical. It's something we'll see the Jedi do a lot as the war progresses. Basically, under the flag of truce, they'll use this uh, stalemate or opportunity to maneuver around their enemy. Now, while that might seem cunning and, and funny for the viewers, it's actually very detrimental to the overall Republic war effort because it basically doesn't allow future Republic forces to really surrender when they need to. Nonetheless, the Battle of Christophus was a good example of each side's strengths and weaknesses. The Separatists always were able to bring in superior numbers to the battlefield, and these armies were usually led by an individual who was quite cunning and skilled. The problem was these leaders oftentimes were forced to micromanage their troops. There simply weren't any good NCOs or officers underneath them that were capable of any kind of decision making. So the droid forces lacked flexibility and ability to react to enemy movements. The Republic, on the other hand, was the exact opposite. They were usually outnumbered, but they had a pretty solid command structure, including a great NCO corps uh, led by the clones. They also usually had relatively good Jedi leadership. I mean, sometimes the Jedi would lead their troops into suicidal frontal charges, but more or less, they were able to react to the combat situation that was unfurling in front of them. The Republic also used the Jedi as special forces, and they were able to target specific objectives that severely limited the enemy's ability to fight. This would also be the first battle where Anakin and Ahsoka Tano would fight together. These were both quite spirited individuals, especially for a Jedi, and that's kind of what makes them perfect partners. They would grow to respect one another's skills and abilities, which means that they'll also be able to temper each other. Because let's be honest, these two come up with some crazy, crazy suicidal plans that really wouldn't work without some, you know, heavy, heavy plot armor. Meanwhile, in the background, Count Dooku continues his plan for kidnapping Rorda the Hutt, son of Jabba, the most powerful member of the Hutt ruling council. One day, while enjoying a nice ride on Jabba's luxury yacht, Rhoda is kidnapped by a Saj Ventress and flown to a remote monastery on the world of Teth. Although adult huts were quite tough and resilient to disease and physical damage, baby huts were pretty much useless. They would remain in their mother's sack until the age of 50, and even then, they only had the intelligence of a normal human 10-year-old. Rhoda was just 10 standard hut years when he was kidnapped, which basically makes him a toddler. So naturally, seeing him kidnapped would make his mother extremely worried. Now, typically speaking, it's very hard to get any type of leverage over a hut. These were very shrewd business people who were very good at what they did. But unlike other species, huts were asexual and able to change their gender whenever they liked. So while they were childbearing, they would switch their sex to female, and their body would be bombarded by different hormones, which would make them more protective of their younglings. It wasn't all that uncommon for a pregnant hut to disregard all issues that weren't childbearing related, even if this means their business enterprise fell apart. So by kidnapping Rhoda and then blaming this on the Jedi, 
Count Dooku found a very realistic way to push the very calculating and neutral Huts to actually take a side in this war. The Hutt's territory in the Outer Rim was very important to both sides of the war. They basically controlled the last neutral hyperspace lanes that connected the core of the galaxy to the Outer Rim. Without it, the Republic was basically cut off from their own forces in the Outer Rim. Since the kidnapping had been so successful, Jabba the Hutt had no leads to follow and sent out a general message asking for anyone for help or information concerning the kidnapping of his child. Chancellor Palpatine, of course, jumped at the opportunity to create better relations with the Hutt territories. Having just successfully captured Christophus, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin, and Ahsoka are basically the only Jedi free for such a mission. Which is what we're going to be talking about in our next episode. If you can't wait until then, be sure to check out our playlist so that you can check out all of the other videos uh, in this series, including the four videos that basically highlight a lot of the background issues that led to the war. This will help you to understand this series a lot better. Also, guys, don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our content. And as usual, guys, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.